I want to honor everyone for your love and for your deep commitment to what we stand to represent. You know, sometimes when you, you see the way people are predisposed to showering so much love and so much honor, it humbles you a great deal. It humbles you a great deal. People started calling me, sending messages from 12 on the dot. Of course, it's because I don't sleep early. My phone has been ringing since morning. Messages show just to show honor. Thank you so much. These things go a long way, not just to encourage, but it humbles us a great deal to remind us that um, the little things we are doing, people see it and people appreciate it. We are humbled at the impact the Lord is making. And um, when we see things like this, we go back to the Lord in brokenness and we ask for the grace to continue and not to fail him. Because when you see thousands of people, thousands of thousands of people showing so much gratitude and honor publicly, it will be wickedness for you to, to fail. It will be wickedness for you to, to fall on the wayside. Because a lot of people look up to you. The faith and hope of so many people depend on you. And they are seeing what you are doing is inspiring them. And so when we see things like this, we are sincerely broken. And it brings us to a point of sober reflection. Asking the Lord to help us to correct errors that we probably may not have noticed. To help us in areas of weaknesses. So we can bring a better witness to a generation that is in dire need of truth. And so this is me and my family and this ministry saying thank you to everyone that have gone out of their way just to show gratitude and to show honor. We see it and we appreciate it. And we, by the help of God, we will continue in grace and we trust the Lord that we will not fall by the wayside or disappoint your convictions and commitment to what we do. Thank you so much. God bless you richly in the name of Jesus. Tonight, it's a very special service. Because of the, the bogus nature of God. You know, our generation is not opportuned to experience empires. In the days of kingdoms and empires, was when you see the glory of kings. There are certain kings that so pretend over over 100 kingdoms, nations and territories. If you have studied the book of Esther, the king Ahasuerus was watching over 127 provinces. That's like a continent. So these kings are so majestic that sometimes when they intend to organize a banquet, what you call a birthday party, I told them not to organize anything today. The nations are bleeding. There's blood shed everywhere. We should pray. We should intercede for the peace of the nations at this time. But when kings wanted to do banquet in those days, in the days of kingdoms and empires, sometimes the birthday celebration of a king would take three months. They will celebrate from one province to another province to another province. It will take three months just to celebrate birthday to show you how bogus these guys were. And so the kingdoms of the earth is nothing compared to the kingdoms of the heavens. And so because of the bogus and boisterous nature of God's kingdom and of his majesty, many times he goes through a lot to raise functionaries that have the capacity to bring witness to his essence, to his will, and to his government. And so when you look at the body of Christ, for instance, you see ministers of God in different order, bringing different dimensions and different kinds of witnesses to the excellency of God. If God has not helped you, sometimes when you see the oppression of some people, you will wonder if this is God. I went for a service somewhere and the minister got up. The moment he stood on the altar, there was a thick 
weight of glory that hit the building. People knelt down and started crying. And then the man himself on the altar couldn't utter a word. He wept for one hour. And we wept and wept and wept. When we were done weeping, he now said he's waiting for authorization. And if he doesn't receive authorization, he will drop the mic and go. And he meant it. When God helped him with a little utterance and he said a few things, he couldn't continue anymore because the burden was much. So we now advise the organizer to collect the microphone so that somebody else can continue the service. At least people came so that we can say something. When the brother came up to collect the microphone, he fell down. That was when we discovered the service was hijacked. And so we wept for another 40 minutes and nobody shared the grace. When, you, when the weight leaves you, you now you go out quietly. You know, there are services where clapping is a sin. It's an abomination to clap. Because of the angels that come into the building. They are, they are watchers. They are judges. So you are careful not to err. So you just, we, we went out of the hall as if we were sneaking. Quietly. You didn't want to destroy. That's a kind of witness. All of those are dimensions of God. You know, the revival in Wales, they were not talking so much. When Evan Roberts come, sometimes he just sits in front and cries for two hours. As he's crying, the banks will shut down. The police station will shut down. The hall will be packed. The whole street will be packed because somebody is crying. And he cried like that until the whole nation was shut down. They had to shut down cells, retrench police officers. The football tournament could not hold because he arrested the civilization by crying. It's the majesty of God. It's the boisterous nature of the king. We have not seen power. When God began to teach me about utterance, he told me utterance have three dimensions. The first dimension of utterance is depth. The second dimension of utterance is intensity. The third dimension of utterance is weight. He said, if you don't have these three components, your words can't pierce the heart of a nation. You may preach well and be exegetically correct, but what brings witness to the soul of a civilization is beyond the intellectual nature of your message. He said, your message must have depth. And depth is a function of encounters. You don't read it in a book. The quality of encounters you have will bring you light and insight that is uncommon. So, five people can talk about love, but when you begin to teach on love from depth, you will preach love from the experiences you walked into when you had encounters in the celestial realm. And when you are done preaching that love, people who were walking in malice and hatred will cry and repent. They won't know what they heard. But you brought light and that light judged iniquity in their lives. It's a dimension. And he said the second dimension of utterance is intensity. Intensity is not loud volume or speaking fast. Intensity is actually a product of the residual presence of God that remains on you as you come out of the presence. So a man who stays in God's presence for a long time will come out with the residual dimension of the presence. It will come with him. So when that man is talking, there will be an energy you'll be interacting with. Even if you don't understand what he's teaching, that energy will, will hit you so hard. Sometimes it can alter the molecular structure of your body. You will hear him and you will lose appetite for sleep. You can hear him all night and you will wake up the next day, you'll be energized. You will come back and hear him. Sometimes you hear one man for three days, you won't sleep. It's against biological process, but the level of energy that he brought in your direction will shut you out of your normal activity. But it's a product of tarrying in God's presence. And then the thought is weight. Weight is a testimony of process. I can teach about righteousness. Somebody else will teach about righteousness. If I'm living in iniquity, my gospel will be more correct. But the guy who is living righteously, when he preaches about it, you must repent. He's not talking what he read. He's giving you a testimony of his life. Because that message for him had become a documentary of his work with God. So a man who has utterance is not a man who speaks good English. He's not a man who talks loud and he's not a man who talks fast. He's actually a man who has depth 
because he has encounters. He's a man who has intensity because he tarries in God's presence. And he's a man who has weight because he has a lot of process. They are scars all over him because of the pathways that God has led him. The dealings of the Holy Spirit that has chiseled him until his life have become a conduit to a generation. Now, utterance is a kind of weakness for this king. And then there are other people that are called the sons of Issachar. The work of the sons of Issachar is their ability to interpret patterns and seasons. So you can be celebrating and a son of Issachar can come for a service. You may even be on a series and then he will come for a service and he will look at your church. Oh, he will tell you to begin to pray every day for four hours because of the next three months. You can't see what he's seeing. The reason is because in three months, maybe an arrow of a scandal will hit your ministry. That series won't save you in that scandal. But a son of Issachar will look into the patterns of the spirit and he will tell you from what I'm reading in the radar, if you don't build energy, you will collapse in three months. And if you understand the ministry of the sons of Issachar, you will find safety. When a man of utterance is talking, what he will do for you is that first he will give you direction. Second, he will give you stamina. And third, he will give you authority. Because when you hear somebody that has insight and depth, he will show you the mind of God. And as he's showing you the mind of God, that will become food for your spirit. So you will first of all have direction, then you have stamina. And then if you begin to do what he's teaching you because it comes with energy, you will discover that your authority level will start increasing. So all trans comes to give direction, it comes to give stamina, and it comes to give authority. But the ministry of the sons of Issachar is to give safety and preservation to a generation. What Joseph did in Egypt was the ministry of the Issachars. They will look at you and say, Egypt is in plenty. But hear me, after these seven years of plenty, there will be another seven years of famine. If you don't store food now, all of you will die. If you don't know that it's an Isaka talking, you may be wondering, how can these things be? After seven years, your peri will reveal to you your level of ignorance. You will repent, but it will be too late. The reason I said all of this is because, you know, even me too, I need to be ministered to. Today is my birthday. I, I don't have a birthday charge. So oh, don't put, there is nothing for any blogger. The reason I said this is because <laughs> I want to bring a son of Isaka to talk to us about the seasons that we are in. This is introduction. We call it apostolic introduction. Please receive with me my brother, God's servant, Prophet J.T. Bakan. 